Not to toot my own horn, but few people are as naturally adept at repression and dissociation as transgender people, especially those of us who grew up in an environment hostile to the so-called gay agenda. Such mechanisms often become baked into our very core from an early age, as our survival hinges on our ability to not show any signs of nonconformity. Of course, growing up in a healthy household or an environment that is accepting of LGBTQ people likely helps more fortunate baby trans from developing such unhealthy traits in the first place. And so I wonder if this phenomenon will still be so common as we slowly head toward a future which is, on the whole, more informed and accepting of trans issues than those older generations that came before. The weird thing about repression as a reflex is that you really aren't aware that it's even happening. Therefore, one of the stranger realizations you come to should you ever begin questioning your gender in the age of the internet is that many of those secret repressed memories you have from childhood, which you thought were wholly your own, are not unique to you. In fact, there's a bizarre collective subconsciousness that unites much of the trans community, especially those who share an approximate age. Some of the more commonly cited examples among people like me, a trans fan born in 1990, are the Tamantha episode of Fairly Odd Parents, Ranma One Half, Greta from Gremlins 2, The Hot Chick, and the Tamantha episode of Fairly Odd Parents. Though I can't speak as much to their experiences, trans mask folks are not without their own examples, including She's the Man, an episode of Wack Fu where two of the female characters drink magic potions and become boys in order to compete in a sports tournament, and, of course, Mulan. Then again, there are two characters in particular that do bridge the gap and unite us all, Jesse and James from the Pokemon anime. I could write pages on each of these, and in fact, I hope to one day. But for now, there's a bit more of an obscure one that I don't really hear people talk about as much. In fact, I'd warrant most people who grew up back then have forgotten the existence of the show, or perhaps even the movie that spawned it. What I want to talk about, as you've already seen in the title, is the two-part first episode of the second season of Ozzy and Drix, the low-rent serialization of the box office flop that was Osmosis Jones. Osmosis Jones is a 2001 animated buddy cop film starring Chris Rock as Osmosis Jones, a white blood cell who is tasked with protecting the body of Bill Murray. This is exactly the type of movie derided by Lindsay Ellis in her video How Aladdin Changed Animation by Screwing Over Robin Williams in which she examines the explosion of animated theatrical releases writing entirely off the names of their voice actors, a phenomenon which she argues began with Aladdin but came to a fever pitch with the release of Shrek, another, though significantly more successful, 2001 film. The success of Aladdin and eventually Shrek is what led to the glut of such generally middling films into our current age, and in the context of such mediocrity, Osmosis Jones really is just part of the wallpaper. I don't think I saw Osmosis Jones when it was in theaters, but I do remember watching it a time or two back in the day, and my opinion of it back then pretty much echoed what the critics had to say. I wasn't a huge fan, though that might be due more to the prejudice I had towards most any animated film that didn't begin with a shooting star over Cinderella's castle, Ironic considering my opinions of that corporation today, but that's a story for another time. To be fair, there are some genuinely clever elements of Osmosis Jones. Whatever your opinion of buddy cop movies as a genre, the use of white blood cells as police in an anthropomorphism of the internal systems of the human body is pretty clever. Plus, the movie has the absolute best representation of what I assume Ben Shapiro, Turfs and other transphobes do upon discovering that someone they find particularly attractive is, in fact, cis. See anything, kid? Oh, I do. Nice jeans. You got the chromosomes in all the right places. Jones, what? But this video isn't about the movie, it's about the spin off that time forgot, and the multiple viewings of it I subjected myself to in order to write this essay. I mean, Seriously, I knew mainstream Western animation was bad through most of the 2000s, but watching Ozzy and Drix again reminded me of just how far we've come since then. Thank you so much, Steven Universe. Your contribution to humanity does not go overlooked. 
Considering the fact that Osmosis Jones was such a critical commercial failure, it seems super weird that it was followed up with an entire TV series. I even remember thinking this back then, but apparently one of the ways Warner Brothers offset the major deficit in earnings versus cost was through pushing the VHS and television home releases of the film. This makes sense in the context of my own memory of it, and I suppose it also makes sense why a very, very low budget television series also spawned from it. When I say low budget, I mean no more Chris Rock, no more Bill Murray, no more any of the original talent, no more live action sequences, and an animation quality that, well, looked much more at home on Kids WB than it would have on the silver screen. Anyway, enough ragging on the quality of Ozzy and Drix. The story follows the two main characters, the aforementioned Osmosis Jones, Ozzy, and his partner Drixenol Cold Relief, or Drix, a generic over-the-counter cold pill that Bill Murray took in the film. This last part is important because a major plot point in the movie is that Drix refuses to only provide temporary relief, and in the very first episode of the show, he and Ozzy are transmitted by a mosquito from the disgusting and presumably soon-to-die animated equivalent, though also pale imitation of Bill Murray, to a young boy named Hector. I'm an English teacher, and so I don't really know a ton about biology or, you know, Benadryl, but that just seems like not how it works. I guess that's neither here nor there, but it's just a detail that really bothered me, and I really couldn't let it go. Okay, so the episode I want to talk about is titled Out of Body Experience, which is a two-parter that makes up episodes one and two of season two. Were it not for this episode, I would have long since forgotten the existence of Ozzy and Drix. Would that I had been so fortunate, but alas. The basic premise of the episode is this. Hector, Ozzy and Drix's host body, nearly drowns after a clumsy fall from the high dive and is only saved when Christine, his love interest, gives him CPR. Unfortunately, or as I thought at the time, fortunately, Ozzy then becomes separated from both Drix and Hector as he is accidentally transferred to Christine's body. I guess being forcibly ejected from your home would be pretty upsetting on its own merit, but to be fair, by this point it should be getting routine for Joan. Regardless, he makes it clear that it's not an ideal situation for him, especially once the forced gender bending starts to affect him. Oh yeah, that's why I remember this show, because apparently, a white blood cell's gender can change according to the gender of its host body. Oh, forced gender bending, you are the shared secret favorite trope of eggs and baby trans everywhere. We all thought we were so alone in yearning for the super contrived circumstances that led to your characters experiencing precisely the sort of euphoria we so craved, and yet. The thing is, when I first went back to rewatch these episodes, I thought what I wanted to talk about was specifically this gender bending element. However, it had been over a decade since I had last seen it, so I didn't remember much of it especially well, except for this line. Then if I stay in Christine, I really will turn into a, a, a girl? Which echoed in the corners of my brain throughout the rest of my adolescence and well into my 20s. And when I did last see it, I was a literal child, so it's not like I exactly caught everything that was going on anyway. I mean, I definitely didn't know the cultural nuance that makes this particular scene so... Yikes. Gender morphed. Halfway to high heels. And we'll get into that, but to limit the problems of this episode to its transphobia would be to ignore all of the latent sexism, misogyny, and homophobia which make up more or less its entire plot. Hence the eventual theme of this video, internalized femphobia. I know it's bad form to define your thesis on the third page, but here we are. What is internalized femphobia? Well, it's probably easiest to first define the umbrella under which it resides, internalized oppression. In short, internalized oppression is when an oppressed group recognizes all the reasons for which they are othered and oppressed, and therefore seeks to cast aside those othering traits in order to improve their social station. 
It is an unspoken system which causes socially disadvantaged minorities to adopt the symbols of their oppressors in order to be perceived as more, and I'm using very heavy air quotes here, normal. Internalized oppression takes many forms. Internalized racism in the U.S. is probably the one most people here are familiar with and can be seen when traits attributed to people of color, such as certain hairstyles or textures, manner of dress or speech, etc., are seen as less than, whereas equivalent traits attributed to white people are, for whatever reason, considered to be greater than. What's your definition of good hair? Something that looks relaxed and nice. If your hair is relaxed, white people are relaxed. If your hair is nappy, they're not happy. Other types include internalized sexism, internalized homophobia, and internalized transphobia. It is under the slightly smaller umbrella of internalized femphobia that each of these are included, at least in the context of this forgotten but very problematic episode of Ozzy and Drix. Femphobia is a term that has been bandied about in feminist and queer study circles for a while now, including in Julia Kay's oft lauded work, Whipping Girl, a transsexual woman on sexism and the scapegoating of femininity. In short, femphobia is a societal hatred of all things which might be perceived as feminine. It's a catch-all term which is used as an explanation for our collective encouragement of tomboys, but our distaste of sissy. For the difference in prejudice faced by more effeminate gay men relative to their more gender normative counterparts, for why trans men as a concept are more often ignored while the idea of trans women is more often accompanied by revulsion, for toxic masculinity, and so on. Internalized femphobia simply takes us a step further by specifically talking about the reasons for which those oppressed by these systems seek to overcome them by better integrating within societal preferences. For me personally, internalized femphobia describes the systems I had to work past in order to accept myself as trans and eventually transition. It might sound odd for someone who always described themselves as a feminist, but internalized oppression works on a subconscious level. So even knowing and experiencing what I did, it was initially very difficult for me to openly do anything which might be perceived as feminine, as, again, subconsciously, feminine equated to bad or weak. So how does out-of-body experience play into this negative social construct? The moment Jones unwillingly begins the process of gender morphation, the show's term for what's going on, by sometimes turning pink and behaving as an over-the-top caricature of a gay male, it becomes extremely clear that this is a thing which is not good. As Jones himself says, Oh no! I think all the girly stuff in here is starting to change me! Like, like some kind of mutant! This pretty much sets the tone for the rest of the episode. There's never once a positive pink Ozzy. Rather, each time it looks a little more like this. High-speed peristaltic engine, full range of armaments, and look, a beverage holder! Ozzy, this is not the time. You have to drive this thing. What? Oh, no, no, no! I can't even ride a 10-speed! Come on, big guy! Look, snap out of it! Ow! You're bruising me! Not that there's anything wrong with a man having a more feminine gender expression, obviously. The issue lies in the fact that this is never once presented as a positive when Ozzy does it. Each time it is met with eye rolls, and it is always framed as him becoming useless in a situation that needs the swift, decisive action of a man. Either of you have any last words? Yeah! <laughs> does anyone have a tissue? <laughs> It's the major plot point of the episode. Every time Officer Celia Tyson needs Ozzy to man up and get them out of trouble, he instead can't pull himself away from his hand mirror, or he simply melts into a puddle of tears. Oh, and every time Jones becomes his pink alter ego, he immediately curls his hair. What's up with that? I mean, I have curly hair, and I honestly did really want Jones to turn into a girl. Maybe there is something to it. Also, remember how I briefly mentioned toxic masculinity earlier? Well, every time Jones unintentionally transforms, it's immediately followed with this sort of garbage. 
Ozzy, snap <gasps> out of it. <gasps> Unless we stop Maximus, you'll never get back to Hector. I know. It's just that each time it takes over, it's harder to come back. Pretty soon, I'll be pretty and pink forever. I gotta fight it. Lakers, huh? <laughs> and the thing is, each time Jones transforms, it's not met with any sort of positivity by the women around him either. Officer Tyson can't help but groan or make a snide comment. Drixine, the gender swapped equivalent of Drix, who resides within Christine, is likewise unamused. What about Victor Victoria? In Christine, it seems like the only time femininity is acceptable is when it is performed by women. Well, at least until the very end, when Celia says that she will miss both of you, which frankly is a case of too little, too late. It's also worth noting that the primary antagonist of this episode, Chief Maximus, is a coded gay villain that could give Scar, Jafar, and Hades each a run for their money. The single male resident of Christine, Maximus wears a long ponytail, speaks almost identically to the aforementioned usurper of Pride Rock, and has eyebrows so fleeky that they're matched only by his razor-sharp eyeliner. But hey, remember when I said that trans men are often ignored? Maximus did give us this little nugget, so at least you guys shouldn't feel so left out this time. Do you have any idea what it's like being a male cell trapped in a woman's body? <laughs> Tell me about it! Overall, while the film did flirt very lightly with the idea of being transferred to a female body, Jones was briefly stuck on Bill Murray's daughter's falsy. This plot device is pretty unique to the show. There was also one notable, very misogynistic scene in the movie. Things are looking grim as temperatures rise to dangerous levels. We have lost all contact with the outer extremities. NNN will stay on the air as long as possible. When we come back, ordinary household appliances that can improve your golf swing. <laughs> you, you silly twit. But again, it was brief. Watching Osmosis Jones again after all these years, yeah, it isn't necessarily a masterpiece and it is intentionally gross in places, but it's not at all problematic in the same sense as out-of-body experience. I have to believe that had the movie followed the same plot and structure as this episode of the show, it would have been even more widely panned in the box office. However, since a random episode of a low-budget Kids WB series was much less likely to garner any sort of real attention, it was able to fly under most people's radars. Can't be demand. Sadly, this was not the case for cable glued millennial youth like me, who basically just voraciously consumed any sort of cartoon that was available at the time. What I remembered most about this episode of Ozzy and Drix are these scenes, where Ozzy goes undercover as Ozmina in a seedy nightclub. Ugh. <laughs> Even going back and watching this episode again, I remember how seeing that made me feel back in 2000 whatever. But what I did not at all remember, but rather subconsciously internalized, was all the overt sexism, misogyny, homophobia, and transphobia which permeates the entire thing. This is a phenomenon which masculine presenting people, or those not on the rainbow spectrum, likely have little awareness of, but for those of us who are femme or identify as any variety of queer, the psychological ramifications of such internalization can take a very long time to overcome. My generation, the millennials, are often derided or praised, depending on one's perspective, for being so hashtag woke. But other than the hashtag, we often overlook what it is we are woke from. Many of us spent our whole lives being subjected to a sort of cash-grabbing, low-quality media that is the natural result of a cynical capitalist system. Furthermore, much of that media ended up propagandizing to us the same sort of negative societal expectations and stereotypes perpetuated since long before our time. Femininity is good. Masculinity is good. The goodness of one is not predicated on the badness of the other. 
The best I can say coming out of my viewing of out of body experience is that it does feel so very antiquated now. Seriously, <laughs> thank God for Steven Universe. Hey, if I asked to buy your lipstick, slap me. I'd love to. Hey, this is my first YouTube video essay in a market that is saturated with YouTube video essays. I think this is the part where I tell you to smash whatever buttons will improve my metrics or whatever. So, like, tell your friends about me. Oh, and if you relate to any of this and have a piece of media that affected you in a similar way, I'd love to hear about it. I could always use more topics to capitalize on in the future. Just one thing. Can I borrow your lipstick? 